This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. I'm seated on a big rock that's very important in the very top of Mount Judy, which is part of the Ararat mountain range. And just above me is where Noah's Ark rested in the mountains of Ararat at about 7,200 feet above sea level. Today it has slid down the mountain and it rests at about 6,500 feet above sea level. But this rock is very important because this is likely where Noah offered his first sacrifices to God after he came out of the ark. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 18, and Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds. And they went forth out of the ark. Now listen to verse 20. And Noah builded an ark an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings upon the altar and the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground for any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. Verse 22, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. But the Bible says, Noah, build it and altar unto the Lord. Well, if you look at this rock, it has a channel that has been cut right in the middle of it. This is not natural. It seems that this is a blood channel. And if this is where Noah offered his first offering, the blood would have flown through this channel. And it was in this place that Noah offered his first sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord and the Lord smelled a sweet smell. That's what happens every time we do something sacrificial in service to the Lord, whether it's our service to Him or it's offerings that we give or time that we invest. It is a sweet smell in the nostrils of the Lord. And it seems that this is the place where Noah offered that sacrifice when everyone came off of the ark. But it's very interesting that if you read Genesis chapter six, verse four, it says that before the ark, that there were giants in the earth. And then it adds the little phrase, and there were giants after that, which means the giants reappeared after all of this. How did that happen? And what do we know about the giants that appeared after the flood? That's what we're going to see in today's program. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. I have been waiting for you. And today we're gonna to return to our subject, which is called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. And as I told you in the introduction to today's program, giants later appeared after the flood. How did that happen? But you know, in today's introduction, I was sitting on that huge stone that has a blood channel carved right in the top of it from thousands and thousands of years ago. Ago, and the ancients said that was the stone where Noah and his family offered their sacrifice to God and where the rainbow first appeared. And in the introduction today, I quoted Genesis chapter 8, 4 by accident. I meant to say Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, where the Bible says, after the flood, it is amazing, but giants reappeared. And that is what we're going to be studying today. But I want you to have the whole series, which is called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. It's 15 parts, and it is really jam-packed. It's like going to Bible school. And it comes with a study guide that is enormous. It's nearly like reading a book. I've put a lot into it, and I want you to have it. And you can order these things by calling or going online. And we're offering you Dr. 
Dr. Dennis Lindsay's wonderful book, which is called Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. And the subtitle says, Ancient Sources to Prepare for the Coming Days. If you want to be prepared for the coming days, then I would recommend you read this book. And again, you can order this by calling the number on the screen or by going online. And when you reach out to us, would you please let us know how to pray for you? That's not a trite statement with us. We're really people of prayer. We want to know how to pray for you. And if you have a need that you're facing or you're dealing with right now, and you just need somebody to get into agreement with you, even though you can pray by yourself, you can also call us and we'll put our faith together with you and Jesus will do something wonderful on your behalf. So write us or call us right now, but reach for your Bible because we always use the Bible in this program. And today we're going to return to Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, and we're going to see the giants reappeared after the flood. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, the Bible says, there were giants in the earth in those days, that's before the flood, and then he adds, and also after that. So giants reappeared after the flood. And we know that the giants who appeared before the flood were the result of mutinous angels who descended out of the heavenly realm. They looked like celestial beings. The people thought they were gods, so they opened their hearts to them. And those mutinous angels had sex with women who then gave birth to giants. And there were notable historical Christian leaders who wrote about it, including Clement of Alexandria. So let me read to you what he wrote. He said, angels partook of human lust, and being brought under its subjection, they fell into cohabitation with women. But from their unhallowed intercourse, spurious men sprang much greater in nature than ordinary men, whom they then later called giants. They were wild in manners and greater than men in size, inasmuch as they were sprung of angels, yet less than angels, as they were born of women. The giants were men of immense bodies. Wow. Then we have the writings of Irenaeus, who said, unlawful unions came about on earth as angels linked themselves with offspring of the daughters of men who bore to them sons, who on account of their exceeding great size were called giants. The angels then brought to their wives as gifts teachings of evil, for they taught them the virtues of roots and herbs and dine and cosmetics and discoveries of precious materials, love philites, hatreds, amours, passions, constraints of love, which included sexual perversion, the bonds of witchcraft, every sorcery and idolatry hateful to God. And when this was come into the world, the affairs of wickedness were propagated to overflowing and those of justice dwindled to very little. Then we have the writings of Tatian. Listen to what he said. Angels were captivated by the love of women and begat children who are those who are called demons. And besides, they afterwards subdued the human race to themselves partly by magical writings and partly by the fears and by the punishments they occasioned and partly by teaching them to offer sacrifices, incense, and libations. And among men, they sowed murders, wars, adulteries, intemperate deeds, and all wickedness. Then we have the reputed writings of Josephus. And Josephus said, for many angels of God accompanied with women and begat sons that proved unjust, despisers of all that was a good on account of the confidence they had in their own strength. For the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians called giants. Now, all of that is a description of the giants that appeared before the flood. But what do we know about the giants that appeared after the flood? What do we know about them? Well, clearly, Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4 teaches that there were giants as a result of this angelic union with women that occurred before the flood, which produced a race of giants and monsters in the earth. And again, that word giant from the Greek word Nephilim describes those that are fallen. These were aberrations. They were not normal. It describes those that possess massive sizes. They had unnatural strength and they propagated evil and violence. However, when we go on, 
we find that before the flood, the earth was thickly populated and became influenced with these horrendous creatures, but they also appeared after the flood, according to Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. So we have to ask a question. If the original angels that cohabitated with women before the flood are now bound in Tartarus, you're going to see that in the next program. That's what we're told both by Peter and by Jude. They are bound eternally in Tartarus. So it makes one wonder how the giants reappeared after the flood, and some wonder if there were other rebellious angels at a later date that did the same thing. But the truth is, there's no clear-cut answer about how these giants appeared again after the flood. And that is one reason why theologians tried to avoid this subject, because they don't know how to answer that question. But my friend, I don't avoid any question. But let's see what Amos chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 says about the giants that appeared after the flood. Here's what it says. It says they were so huge the giants after the flood, that their height was to be compared to the great cedar trees of Lebanon, and those trees were enormous. The giants after the flood so thickly populated the land of Canaan that when Moses sent the 12 spies in to search out the land, they returned with an evil report and said the giants they saw were so enormous that they felt like grasshoppers in comparison to them. That's what we read in Numbers chapter 13, 32 to 33. Listen to this. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched, and they so told the children of Israel, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. But notice, they said it's a place that eats up the land and just eats everything. Well, that's what giants were known for. They were known for consuming everything, including people and drinking blood. We are told of giants throughout the entire early Old Testament, but it seems the most famous of all the giants were the Anakim. In Deuteronomy 128, the Bible says, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. These were terrifically large giants. Then we read in Deuteronomy 2, 10 to 11, The Emims dwelt there in times past, a people great and many, and as tall as as the Anakims, which also were accounted as giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emmons. So again, we read about the Anakims being so great that their walls went up to the heavens. Then you come to Deuteronomy 2, 18 to 21, where the Bible says, there also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumums, a people great and many as tall as the Anakims. There again, we find about the Anakims, and we find that there are other tribes of giants as well. Then we come to Deuteronomy 9, verses 1 and 2, which says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyselves, cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims. Again, we find the Anakims. Then you come to Joshua 11, verse 22, where the Bible says that there was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod there remained giants. So again, we find giants. Then in Joshua 14, 12 and 14, we read that Caleb said, give me this mountain where the Lord spake in that day for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there and their cities were great and fenced. Again, we read about the Anakins. But in addition to the Anakins, there were also the Rephaim. And we read about the Rephaim in Joshua chapter 18, verse 16, which refers to the valley of the son of Hinnom, and which is the valley of the giants on the north. But hey, 
in addition to the Anakims, in addition to the Rephaim, we find there were many, many tribes of giants in the Old Testament, including the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Horams, the Avims, and the Zamzumums. My friends, there were many, many tribes of giants that are mentioned in the Old Testament. But God destroyed the first category of giants with a worldwide flood. But then God promised that he would never destroy the earth again with another flood. So he expected his people to do the job of exterminating these giants. Wow, that is amazing. Then when you come to Genesis chapter 14, 5, the Bible speaks of the Rephaim and the Zumums and the Imams. Then when we come to Genesis 15, 19 to 21, the verse refers to the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. These also were tribes of giants. Then you come to Deuteronomy 2, 10 to 11, and it says... The Emums dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and as tall as the Anakims, and were also accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emons. So here again we find different tribes of giants. Then you come to Deuteronomy 2, 20 to 21, and it says that there was a land of the giants, giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Amorites called them Zamzumums, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. Now that is amazing. There are so many references to giants in the Old Testament, but a very famous giant was King Og of Bashan, a giant so enormous that he slept on a bed made of iron to support him. His physical dimensions are revealed by the size of his bed, which was 18 and a half feet long and eight and four inches wide, and it was constructed to accommodate the height and the width of his body. This was simply an enormous giant. Deuteronomy 3, 11 to 13 says this, for only Og king of Bashan remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. And then it describes the dimensions of the bed. Nine cubics was the length thereof and four cubics the breadth of it after the cubic of a man. Wow, this was an enormous giant. Then you come to Joshua 12 verses 4 to 6 and one fragment of those verses refers to the coast of Og king of Bashan which was of the remnant of the giants. Read the whole verses however. Then you come to Joshua 13 12. It refers to all the kingdom of Og in Bashan who remained of the remnant of the giants. And then when you come to Joshua 15, 8, it refers to the valley of Hinnon, which is the end of the valley of the giants. Then Joshua 17, 15 refers to the land of the Perizzites and of the giants. Then you come to Joshua 8, 16, which refers to the valley of the giants. So we see there were giants before the flood, but they were wiped out because of the flood. But giants then reappeared later mysteriously. We don't quite know how. We don't have all of those answers. But God said he would never send another global flood to destroy the earth. So he gave his people the responsibility to exterminate them. Wow. But in all ancient civilizations, they portray gods philandering with women, the women then giving birth to giants. And we find many times in ancient civilizations, it speaks of giants having very strange forms like Og, king of Bashan. He was huge. We know in the Old Testament, it even speaks of giants that had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. Wow. We read that in 2 Samuel 21, 18 to 20. Listen to this amazing verse. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines of Gob. And Shebekai, the Hushanite, slew Saph, 
which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elhanah, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle to in Gath where a man was of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he also was born to the giants. You know, if you look at ancient mythology, you find there were giants like Cyclops that had three eyes, one in the middle of his forehead. There were all kinds of creatures. And we know that if you look at Greek mythology, the gods came down, philandered with women. The women gave birth to children who produced demigods like Heracles, who in Latin is called Hercules. These were the byproducts of the so-called gods. Well, my friends, all of this mythology really has its roots in the Bible. It all begins in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, verse 2, and verse 4, when angels co-mingled with women who produced monstrosities. This is not legend or fantasy. These things really took place. But the first occurrence of giants occurred before the flood of Noah. And it was an infiltration so terrible that God knew he had to take merciful action before it was too late. And the flood was actually an act of mercy. And when God knew that only Noah and his family remained genetically pure, and the time was running out, that is when God took merciful action to wipe everything out and to start all over. Now, my friends, that's a lot of information. I know you can't remember all of that, and that is why I want you to order the whole series. But when we come back tomorrow, we're going to see what Peter and Jude said about the fate of the angels that sinned. What happened to them? And you're going to find that both Peter and Jude quote the book of Enoch, but then they elaborate and they expand on it and they tell us explicitly what God did with the angels that sinned. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be great. But hey, I'll be back in just a moment and I want to pray for you. Finally, Rick Renner has unlocked the mystery surrounding the sons of God and the giants that appeared in the earth before the flood during the days of Noah. To film this riveting series, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, Rick and his team traveled to eastern Turkey to the ruins of Noah's Ark. In this series, Rick dives deep into the scriptures to give you answers about who are the sons of God in Genesis 6, 1 and 2? What does the promise of 120 years really mean? Where is the real location of Noah's Ark today? Rick says, this is the series I've wanted to teach for decades. With the research we conducted at the real Noah's Ark, along with amazing historical records, I believe this long-awaited series will answer a multitude of questions for people who have wondered about the strange events that occurred before the flood and what Jesus said about them being repeated at the end of the age. This 15-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $24. In addition, we're offering Dennis Lindsay's astounding book, Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. This book will amaze you and open your mind to mysteries hidden in the Bible that have great impact on our world today. This book can be yours for $20. Don't delay. Order this bundle of the 15-part series, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, and the book, Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and I'm standing outside the new TV studio in Moscow. Praise God, most of the interior is already finished. They're still working on Denise's studio, so pray for us as we continue, it's gonna be nice. And if you see the big bulldozer behind me, that's because they're getting ready to do the parking lot. You know, winter comes pretty early in our part of the world, so we need to really seize the moment and get this parking done before the cold weather sets in. But hey, we're making progress and praise God, the studio is paid for. This is all paid for. And I wanna say thank you for being the most amazing partners and helping us with this. And now the project in front of us is to pay off the Tulsa facility. We want to retire the debt on the big office complex in Tulsa 
because when that's paid off, suddenly all those finances are gonna be released for us to go on more TV and minister to people all over the world. My friends, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, 21, that the lips of the righteous feed many. I know that's my assignment, to feed as many people the Word of God as possible, and I'm doing it with you. Wow, thank you for being a partner. You're part of the giving team that's helping us make amazing progress. And if you're not a part of the giving team yet, please pray about joining us to retire the debt on the Tulsa building. It's not about buildings. It's just about having the space we need so that we can effectively minister to people. We want to retire that debt so we can take the Word of God to more parts of the world where people are crying out for teaching they can trust. And I want to say thank you for everything you do. I want to say thank you again for being with me today and remind you about my series, which is called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. It's 15 parts, and it comes with a study guide. Just today alone, I've given you so much information that I know you cannot recall it all. That's why I want you to have the series so you can hear it all and really study it. And I also want you to order the book by Dr. Dennis Lindsay, which is called Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. But you know, today I taught you that when the giants first appeared before the flood, God sent a worldwide flood to wipe them out. Then the giants mysteriously reappeared after that, but God said he would never send a flood again to destroy the earth. And since God would not send a flood to destroy the reappearance of the giants, he gave the responsibility to his people to wipe them out. And my friends, in the very same way, we have been given a divine responsibility to push evil out of our lives. And if you find that some giant of evil or sickness or some kind of an attack has come against you, God is not going to send a flood to get rid of it. But God's given you authority. He's given you the Bible. He's given you the Word of God. He's given you the power of the Holy Spirit. And you have everything you need to exterminate any attack that has come against you. You can do it. You've been equipped by the Spirit of God and by the blood of Jesus to deal with any giant that has tried to invade your personal territory. My friends, you can rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit and drive it out. And for that reason, today I want to pray for you for the blood of Jesus, the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, the authority of Jesus' name to be released in your situation. Put your hand on your heart. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you have equipped us with everything we need to drive every vile giant out of our lives. We thank you, Father, that you've called us to do it and we can do it. You've even given us the glorious name of Jesus, which is higher than any other name and every giant must submit to it. And we command those giants and that evil to go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, please reach out to us and let us know how to pray for you. You can call us or you can write to us. But until tomorrow, please remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there is power. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.